Hello everyone, welcome to MLAS 700, Advanced Cybernetic Systems Development, and this is Cybernetic Principles and Cognitive Processing, and this is going to be our second lecture um, for this week. Uh, and um, we're going to go ahead and get this going with an overview of cybernetics, which I have to say has changed quite a bit, even from when I recorded um, these um, uh, MLAS 650 as well as MLAS 100 and 200 at the undergrad level a couple years ago. Um, even the field of cybernetics has undergone some changes that threw me for a loop when I was building this, um, this, uh, this out. Um, and then um, I, I had to put them in there. I had to get this in for um, lecture because it's actually a pretty interesting development. So let's, without, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into it for um, cybernetics and an overview of what it is. And we, we, we did a quick primer of it. We know that cybernetic loops, we talked about it, what a first, um, what is a, a um, first order cybernetics versus second order cybernetics. And um, I highly encourage everyone to jump out to the Wikipedia, you know, just do a cursory review of cybernetics as it relates to um, um, the, the, the full treatment, right? And, and Wikipedia does a very good job of giving you the high level. Highly encourage everyone to check it out. Um, and so um, I, when you, w one of the things that jumped out at me was that cybernetics was put under this cyborgology, cyborgology, right? This, this idea of this, this, almost like it's this archaeology, right? It's, it's its own discipline that's been built up under this concept of cyborgs. And it got me thinking like, okay, I guess that makes sense because now we've got humanoid robots now that we're, we're contending with that, I mean, we didn't even think was available a couple years ago. We were like, holy smokes, this is not, this is, we actually have humanoid robots that are running around, and we indeed do, and they're not just a little good, they're a lot good. Um, so it's pretty wild what's out there. Um, so I, I've been keeping track of this, this kind of this page here, and there's been some new changes, there's been some adjustments to this, and one of the big things that jumped out at me was this idea of cyborg anthropology. This is this theory of cyborg anthropology. Um, it has been, it's been out for some time, cyborg, that concept of cyborg anthropology. Um, I'm not going to give it a full treatment here. I, I don't want to, we're, we're not, we're not getting into, um, this isn't an anthropology course. But if you're interested, I highly recommend you check that out. It's kind of neat. It's pretty interesting. Um, and uh, definitely gets into the idea of humans and our integration of technology uh, uh, and our place within how we've evolved culturally to, to require technology to live, if that makes sense. And not just, not just stone tools as technology, not just hammers as a, as a form of technology, which they are, right? But, but digital technology, it's really focusing on the, the, the computing uh, aspects of how we're augmenting our bodies and how we're augmenting our consciousness with uh, large language models and how we're augmenting our bodies with um, um, cybernetic machines like pacemakers and more advanced, like Neuralink, more advanced um, uh, um, communication, collaborative communication devices, right? Um, so it, it's it's uh, it's pretty interesting. Highly recommend a, a read on that. Um, it's not something I'm requiring. Just something that if you if you happen to be bored, it's a it's a, it's a fun read. Okay, let's jump into the history of um, cybernetics and um, take you through the first wave. So back in the 40s, um, cybernetics had its first formalization, um, and then in the 50s, it was officially kind of found, I should say, it, it got its sea leg, so to speak, and became a formal technical discipline. And then from the 50s and in, in, into the 60s, there was this thing called the Macy's Conferences um, in cybernetics, that really gave it a really, um, they, they were kind of these informal papers, and informal discussions is probably a better way to put it, um, where people were brought together to, to kind of give, give cybernetics its underpinnings. And, um, and it's this concept of this transdisciplinary approach that kind of came out of it. And artificial intelligence was part of cybernetics back then. And, um, but it did branch off um, in, in the 50s as its own discipline. Um, and, and people may be familiar with um, Alan Turing 
um, who had a lot to do with um, that and, and um, really gave us a lot of what we would say was the um, uh, underpinnings of artificial intelligence as we move into the digital age, right? Computational. Because the, the underpinnings of artificial intelligence go way back into the 1500s um, when we talk about statistics and games of chance um, that, that were... Um, um, I wouldn't say formalized, but um, they were uh, conceptualized back in the fifty. I'm sorry, in the fifteen hundreds. Um, but the idea of artificial intelligence has actually culturally have been around for a really, really, really long time. Um, you can go back really far back. I mean, we're talking thousands of years back. Um, but anyway, I, I don't want to go too too far down that rabbit hole. It is a fun one to do. Um, but, um, again, we're, we're kind of going to bring us back to, um, what's going on here, moving on into the second wave. Um, and, um, when you look at what goes on with cybernetics, the idea of circular causality, uh, it gets, gets expanded in this idea of goal direction and goal oriented reflexivity and reflexivity and recursion, um, kind of get developed. And then um, from there, um, it starts to move into um, organizational cybernetics, right, where we get um, the idea that cybernetics just doesn't have to be used at a lower level, but it can be used in, um, um, a, a, in a second-order sense. It can be used that incorporates the humans into that loop, not just technological machines, but, oh, okay, now, I've, now I can do cybernetics at an organizational level because I'm incorporating humans and their behavior in that loop. Um, so after that, third wave comes in in the 90s, and um, there has been a, a, quite a bit of um, movement, um, even more. I'd say there's, I'd almost say there's a fourth wave in, that um, has been um, emerging. I guess you're. I guess we could say we're at the end of the third wave, and that's why we don't see a fourth wave just yet. But there is going to be a, a fourth wave because we have these things called um, cyber human systems, um, cyber physical systems, which is the, um, the 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 physical manifestation of systems that um, are are um, edge bound, but then keep humans connected to them, like our phones. Um, there's just all kinds of different ways that we can take this, the cybernetics route and see that a fourth wave is actually happening now in the, in the 2020s. Um, and especially as it relates to, wait, well, how do humans interoperate with humanoid robots? Um, so that's going to be very much a conversation that, that um, I believe will probably showcase that there's this fourth wave of cybernetics and, and advanced cybernetics as it relates to um, the, the increased augmentation of us, uh, for, of humans and technology. All right. So uh, principles, key principles of cybernetics, we're familiar with this. The big ones are feedback, control, and communication. Um, and uh, these are um, the, the tenets of cybernetics. And um, we don't have to spend too much more time on this. So we've, we've, we know this. We're familiar with this. Um, and now the applications of cybernetics um, is, uh, is not just... Um, we've, we talked about this in the last lecture just from a primer perspective um, on intelligent autonomous systems. Um, but it's, it's really like it's really moving forward, like I said, in a fourth wave now because it's not just cybernetics. It's just this pie in the sky. Oh, you know, uh, it sounds cool. Sounds cool in the movies. But what is it really? Is it a technical discipline? Is it a, but it is. It's um, cybernetic engineering or engineering cybernetics or technical cybernetics is its own. Um, there are, it, it's more prevalent um, in Europe than it is in, in the United States. Um, but it very much is a its own discipline, its own engineering discipline, um, and so it it can it it has many applications, right? Not just theoretical application. You know, it's it's like I said, it's it's got. We're actually actively 
um, looking at what does the future look like when we talk about cybernetics and human augmentation of technology, but not just human augmentation, but um, cybernetic machines that are independent, again, intelligent autonomous systems that are independent of humans in the loop um, and, and fully autonomous. Um, so that, that brings up all kinds of industrial implications. Um, what do we do when it comes to insurance? What do we do when it comes to um, robots that want to enter a social contract or robots that want to exit a social contract? There's just so many different aspects of that that oof, we're, we're just scratching the surface, but we're, we're not far away. Um, okay, so I do want to talk a little bit about what is a cognitive engine and then um, get to a little bit of this idea of, like, I, you, you probably heard me last lecture talk about bare metal programming, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but, um, you know, when it comes to um, a cognitive engine, um, at its core, a cognitive engine is this idea of it's a autonomous system, of course, that is independent of a human. Um, remember that this is what this is. And uh, in, in, in an intelligent autonomous systems capacity, it's independent of a human. Um, but I do want to make uh, um, a distinction, or I would say a, a clarification, that a cognitive engine is also your, the human brain. It's a biological computer, um, and it is, in many respects... It is a engine. It is a computing engine. It just uses, again, a different scaffolding underlying it. It has a different framework, but it's a computing engine, right? It's an information processing engine. Um, it gets feedback from its environment. It receives input from, its, from the eyeballs, from the ears, from the nose, from proprio uh, reception from fingers and all kinds of fun stuff. And it takes all this information, integrates it, <laughs> excuse me, and then makes, um, makes motor output, right? How do I move? How do I walk? How do I, how do I interpret the world? How do I process what's happening and then make decisions around what do I do? What, do, what does it want to do next? So um, processing, cognit it's, it, in other words, it's a cognitive engine, a brain is, a um, human brain is. Um, and so as we get more advanced with the robots that we're building, well, it, it, those are going to, they are cognitive engines as well. Um, they, um, are built to do exactly everything that I just described. And eventually they're going to, um, have more, um, capability and, um, there'll be a lot of new questions that we're going to have to contend with here pretty soon um, in terms of what is... And, and, and I'm trying not to make a distinction. I Rather, let me rephrase that. I am, at the moment, making a distinction between cognition and consciousness. But consciousness is just a... Is, um, a expansion of a cognitive engine. That's all that is. Um, it is a, a byproduct of cognition. And um, when that cognitive engine disappears, when the brain dies, that consciousness goes with it. It's part of the programming. It's part of the, the biological engine that is your human brain. Um, so that, that's something that um, when we talk about what we have to contend with on the, the, the robots that we're building these days, especially humanoid robots, it brings up a lot of philosophical and ethical things that we have to consider. But again, I don't, I don't want to get too far past that because this is a very, this is a technical course, a programming course. I'm just, I just want to give you, your grad students, I want you to think a little bit um, existentially, so to speak. Okay. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So um, next up is I, I want to impress upon everyone that as we go into the next next week that what we're going to be doing is we're going to getting we're going to get into uh, a little bit of low level programming which is the bare metal programming and then um we'll be doing high level programming um so low level programs when i say bare metal 
um, I didn't really give it a lot of, uh, of, of definition in the last lecture. But when I say bare metal, what we're talking about, bare metal programming, is it's more directly tied to the hardware. That's what we mean. It gives you more control over what's going on, but it's actually, it's really, com it's more complex to work with. Um, but you haven't done any of that lower level bare metal programming yet, so that we're going to introduce that, right? This is the advanced course. We're going to bring more of that in. We're also going to be doing more high level programming. Um, and as we move along, I'll be um, putting in, um, uh, my, my hope is that we'll be putting in more machine learning because in, in MLAS 650, we just didn't have quite the horsepower to do um, a lot of the heavy lifting that you would traditionally be able to do from a machine learning perspective. So my hope is that we can do more of that here. Okay. Um, now, high-level programming you're familiar with, it, it goes through, it uses the theory of abstraction. No, it doesn't use the theory. It, it, is, it is an abstraction layer, right? High-level programming. Um, sits on top of an operating system and you usually work through an OS and you got to go through multiple layers of abstraction from high level through the OS. The OS translates that to assembler and assembler uh, interacts with the hardware directly. Um, it, it saves time. Higher level programming allows you to do more complicated things more quickly versus lower level programming which does not allow you to do more complicated things more quickly. Um, it's There's, there's a... Um, there's a trade-off between bare metal programming and higher level programming. Um, so that's the, the big one. As it relates to programming using these in cybernetic systems, um, usually a lower level programming, a bare metal, um, bare metal programming is used where um, I have a very, very, very small defined um, uh, use case. And the use case needs to be very fault tolerant and, and uh, memory error resistant, um, and it needs to work all the time. And so usually what you do is you see bare metal programming in those applications. Um, and uh, life or death situations, typically you're going to see bare metal programming. You don't typically see bare metal programming in, I'm sorry, um, you don't see higher level programming languages used in in uh, situations where there's big life and death situations, right? You'll see them in applications, like, you know, you know if you're, you're on a website and if something errors out, it's, you know, you, you're on an Amazon, you know, you're checking your order on your Amazon. Um, it's, it's not a problem if, if the error, the, the, the um, JavaScript that you're using errors out and you got to refresh the page, right? Oh, okay, it's not a big deal. Um, but you can't quite do that um, when you're talking about something that, that, that has a very, very high importance or criticality to it. Um, and so there's some, some distinctions there when it comes to cybernetic systems. And um, that is something that we, um, in this course, will we'll, um, um, take a look at um, in terms of giving you exposure to the differences between bare metal programming and high-level programming. Um, okay. So, um, what are cognitive computing engines? What are cognitive processing engines? Um, and you probably are like, what is a cognitive engine? What is all this stuff? And Well, they didn't, I mean, when you talk about a cognitive engine, it, I mean, the, the term has been around for a long time, but it wasn't widely understood. But if you look at it now, um, oh, man, I mean, everybody's jumping on the bandwagon, right? I mean, it's... Um, if you put in cognitive engine, you'll find a bunch of stuff. Here's just a quick, uh, I wanted to kind of throw that out there. There's just a bunch of, of um, the community. What is a cognitive engine? You can find it. Um, and different versions of it. What does that mean? Usually, typically, it includes some type of artificial intelligence framework. You'll hear, um, you know, it's, it's uh, machine learning algorithms or, or an ensemble cast of, of machine learning algorithms. Um, there's just, it's, um, it's quite expansive. Um, in, in other words, it's becoming more mainstream. Um, and, and I want to, I want the class to understand that cognitive engines, um, as, as a framework are, um, something that they uh, aren't hypothetical. 
the, these we have them today. Large language models are a perfect example of that. Open AI, a perfect example of a cognitive engine. Uh, and these things just get, keep getting better and better every day. Okay, um, so for us, we are going to be working more closely because it's a cybernetic course um, and we're doing cybernetic development. Um, we are actually, I, I want to talk a little bit about the Arduino and we're going to learn a lot about this, but we're going to be using the Arduino Uno R4, um, and it's a really great, it's a great engine, it's a great hardware platform for us. Think of it like Raspberry Pi or, you know, like a, um, um, a Jetson Nano, if you're familiar with those, um, or an ESP32, um, which is a lower, smaller um, controller with not quite as much horsepower. Or even even um, the the Adafruit controller that you were using in MLA S six fifty. This controller though is really um, I love this controller because it gives us the ability to do bare metal programming and higher level programming in one platform, and that's not something that you can do in a lot of controllers. So this makes it a really good controller for us in terms of being able to do. Um, lower level embedded systems all the way up to higher level IoT edge systems. Um, so I'm pretty excited about this, um, this controller. Um, you might be naturally saying, well, we could have just used a Raspberry Pi. Well, Raspberry, the thing is, Raspberry Pi to get to do bare, it's harder on a Raspberry Pi to do bare metal programming. It's out of the box, doesn't have a lot of capabilities because a Raspberry Pi operates off of a, um, a Debian Linux operating system. So a Raspberry Pi uses an OS. Basically what I'm saying is, is a Raspberry Pi is a very, very small single, what we call an SBC, a small single board computer. It's, it's, a, it's a laptop shrunk down or a workstation shrunk down into a very, very tiny, small card deck. And that is um, what a Raspberry Pi is. That's also what a Jetson Nano is also. That uses Ubuntu um, and not Raspbian, which is what um, Raspberry Pis use. But Jetson Nanos use um, Ubuntu, and um, which, again, another Linux OS, um, which is fine. It allows you to do more complex autonomous systems. Um, but they um, are primarily focused on your interaction with a Raspberry Pi or a Jetson Nano is going to be through a higher level, um, a high level programming language. Now that's something at, that um, you, you can't, it's not to say that you can't access at a lower level, um, lower level languages um, on those frameworks. You can, it's doable, but the accessibility of an Arduino for being able to do that is it's it's so much more um, uh, user friendly for us to be able to do bare metal programming on an Arduino than it would be uh, on those other systems. So that's why we're using Arduino. And in this case, we've got a nice setup here for the uh, Arduino um, Uno R4. Okay. All right. So um, where are these cognitive processing engines used as of today, lately? Well, that you can see, um, this is kind of a fun one. I just got a picture. This is from Northrop Grumman. Um, you may have seen pictures of this um, um, under uh, uncrewed underwater vehicle. Um, and this, this manta ray um, is uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, but Ukraine has been fielding submersibles. Um, they've been you know, they've been fielding munitions that are um, that that are um, uncrewed uh, uh, boats, you know, and you know these kamikaze boats that that, that are out there. But um, they're the, it, it, again primarily on the military side. But um, there are going to be more and more applications where there's going to be a lot more sea surveillance, air surveillance, autonomous sea surveillance, autonomous air surveillance. Um, uh, there's just so many applications, um, you know, firefighting and, and uh, search and rescue and just all kinds of different things that can be done. So the applications, industrial um, applications for these uh, cognitive engines is just, there's a lot. There's going to be more and more, and the future is going to be filled with more and more cognitive engines. Okay. 
Well, um, that is it. That's all I have for learning activity two. Uh, next up, what I want you to do is um, I want you to head over. I'm going to pull this over. I want you to head over to um, the modules, and I want you to go to reading assignments three. And uh, there's going to be two readings here that we have. Uh, U.S. Navy Strategy for Intelligent Autonomous Systems. I want you to read that. Um, I also want you to spend some time um, this weekend um, reading cognitive systems and cognitive computing and get some notes down. What are your thoughts on that? Because that's, that's what I want your learning activity, um, your reflection paper, um, to give me some ideas um, on uh, your thoughts. Again, remember comparing and contrasting between an intelligent autonomous system, uh, a cognitive system, and a cognitive computing system. Um, and kind of what that all looks like. Um, and um, so give me, give those a read. Um, and that's what uh, you're going to be up for um, this week in terms of um, your um, assignment. So you, you have an assignment for reading um, those, two, those two papers. Okay, that's all I have. I appreciate it. Um, if you have any issues with your, um, your kit, let me know. Um, hopefully they're, they, um, if they arrive by the weekend, you should be in good shape, even if it arrives in by early, early next week. Um, I highly encourage you to kind of pick through it, look through it, um, and get familiar with kind of the components of that, that kit. And then, um, and, uh, next Thursday, um, again, we'll, um, we'll start to hit the labs, um, by, uh, next Thursday. All right. If you've got any questions, feel free to text or email. We'll talk to you later and see you next week.